My name is Ahmed. I'm the CEO of Swimming Canada, and I'd like to welcome you here today. Uh, the presentation will be mainly in English. Uh, la présentation sera uh, la, de la plupart en, en anglais, mais uh, s'il y a des questions en français, uh, soyez pas gênés de demander des questions en français uh, dans leur uh, dans leur chat box, uh, puis uh, on va les traduire et uh, répondre uh, dans, la, dans les questions dans les deux langues. Um, so thank you for, uh, very much for joining us today in our first webinar series. Um, we have a great topic today, uh, which uh, has excellent timing given uh, things that are going on and programs that are going on. And we, we've assembled a great group of speakers as well. Um, so, uh, some of our key objectives uh, for today, obviously the introductions and uh, who we have on the call. Uh, I'm going to take us just through some a little bit of background and some key research. Uh, Swimming Canada does do quite a bit of research with uh, an external research partner that uh, works for uh, many large corporations and they also do research for us as well. Um, but I'm not going to spend much time on it, um, understanding that everyone on here uh, uh, does uh, see the value of uh, swimming in general and aquatic facilities. Um, so uh, we'll talk about uh, just a little bit of background, key research insights, uh, why aquatic facilities is important, and then we'll move on to uh, are you shovel ready or do you want to be? And um, we have uh, fabulous experts on the call who uh, will be able to take us through that. And then a roadmap for the future uh, from our partner, Mirtha Cools. Uh, Mirtha has been our partner for uh, well over a decade, if not more, and uh, they are the standard uh, from the global FINA perspective. Um, and uh, a thing I want to say about Mirtha is Mir Mirtha is often recognized for the Olympic, Paralympic 50 meter tank. However, uh, they are extremely versatile and have uh, a multitude of pro programs and projects around the world. Uh, that uh, meets any size and so um, that uh, you'll likely see throughout the, uh, the presentation today and feel free to, to, to ask questions uh, as we go through this uh, to, uh, to any of the experts. Uh, we may not answer them right away because sometimes uh, we do have questions that come in that um, uh, are repetitive, so we have someone monitoring the questions and we'll be able to take those throughout. So thank you again for coming, and uh, I do uh, see a huge list here of uh, people from uh, uh, varied backgrounds, uh, diverse backgrounds. Uh, I see a, a large portion of the Ontario Aquatic Council, so thank you for being here today, we appreciate that. And uh, to everyone who has dialed in from all across the country in all your different roles. Uh, we definitely appreciate it. So uh, for myself, Ahmed Elawadi, I've been the CEO at Swimming Canada for eight years. Prior to that, uh, I was the CEO at uh, Water Polo for six and on the uh, Olympic program at uh, Water Polo for uh, probably another 10. Before that, um, uh, I have a diverse, <laughs> I, I was working for technology while I was uh, working with the Olympic team uh, and the junior teams. Um, prior to that, I spent 10 years at the city of Dorval in the aquatics uh, department and parks and recreation. And I, uh, my background has always been swimming ever since my father threw me in the pool for the first time and I started to drown. And uh, a lifeguard came over and said, you know, we have swimming lessons. So, uh, which was great for me. So, um, uh, we have Stu Isaac uh, on the line. Stu has spent his entire life in the aquatic community uh, as a national swimmer, college swimmer, national team, coach in the United States for 26 years, uh, uh, coach in the United States, spent 26 years in marketing management positions as an executive at Speedo. Uh, he has worked closely with Swimming Canada. He's worked closely with USA Swimming. Uh, he's uh, worked closely with projects in Canada and the United States and continues to do so. Um, the Isaac Group was started in 2009 and is a consulting group uh, that uh, works uh, with Mirtha as well as other companies and advises Swimming Canada and USA Swimming as well. 
um, Dan Thompson. Uh, Dan is the CEO of Mirtha Pools. Uh, he is a well-known brand name here in Canada, 1980 Olympic swim team, uh, national team, uh, a member from the 80s. He is a past president of Swimming Canada, a past president of Swim Ontario. He is currently an active and avid master swimmer and passionately involved in swimming for over 40 years. Uh, and then finally, Mark Versfeld. Um, he's uh, grown up training and competing in pools across the prairies, represented Canada on the podium at many times, uh, including silver and bronze medals at the 1998 World Championships, uh, double gold 1998 uh, Commonwealth Games, uh, 2000 Olympian. Um, he is a master swim coach, surf lifeguard in Australia, and currently serves on the Swim BC Board of Directors and also represent Mirtha Pools in Western Canada. So uh, we have a great team here. So uh, just a little bit of a, a background. Uh, swimming Canada is the governing body for the competitive sport of swimming in Canada. Um, uh, we are the number one ranked uh, Olympic summer sport. Um, now, athletics will argue with us, uh, and I'm glad to have that argument with them, but uh, we uh, definitely have uh, positioned ourselves uh, over the last uh, decade into a very strong position uh, internationally and, uh, and locally as well. In addition, uh, we have a coalition with the Canadian Red Cross, Life Saving Society, YMCA, um, um, and we work actively with them. And we are also a part of Aquatics Canada, which represents water polo, artistic swimming, diving, high diving, and open water. So um, we, uh, we definitely uh, are active in the, the community just outside of Swimming Canada uh, is direct membership. Uh, we uh, tip over around 50,000 competitive swimmers annually. There are around 2 million, 2 million plus children in swimming lessons uh, a year. Uh, there's 100,000 officials, 4,000 coaches, 20,000 master swimmers that register. Uh, and uh, there are likely 10 times that amount that just swim uh, for healthy living. Uh, we also know that there, from our research, uh, there's over 10 million Canadians that partake in some form of swimming, whether uh, it's at a cottage, a lake, uh, um, you name it, beaches or vacations, different things like that. Uh, we have a professional infrastructure for distribution. Uh, so uh, through our uh, PSOs, through uh, we have used uh, uh, resources from the Canadian Red Cross and Life Saving Society to deploy programs nationally. Um, and we access uh, those lifeguards at outdoor pools as well. Uh, so uh, we're not just focused on competitive swimming, but focused on other areas as well. Uh, which brings us to our current strategic plan, which expires in August. However, our new strategic plan is very much uh, similar. Sorry if we can go back a slide. Yeah, thank you. Um, so really uh, two, uh, two main priorities uh, is performance and athlete development. And then the second one is being a leader in organizational excellence. Uh, and I'm proud to report that our strategic plan has been on track and uh, we have been successful in all our areas. And then some of the areas that were sunset due to um, uh, when the plan was created, uh, it was relevant at the time. But however, as, as an eight year period goes on, things change. Uh, and so we're moving into our new strategic plan, which will be very similar to this, but we will update it uh, and it will be published shortly uh, in uh, July with uh, some, uh, some new initiatives that we're looking forward to in our next uh, two quadrennial cycles. But part of our strategic plan uh, is uh, the growth of swimming in Canada. And there is a direct relation to the growth of swimming in Canada and facilities and the growth of facilities, the upgrades of facilities. And that's what we want to talk about today, those shovel ready projects or becoming shovel ready. Um, and that could be uh, upgrading a facility, building a new facility, uh, expanding a facility. Um, so those are uh, things that uh, do uh, are, are close to our heart. Um, and uh, the more people that we get swimming in the water, 
the more it influences Swimming Canada, the more it influences any sport that is dependent on swimming or aquatics, um, sailing, canoe, kayak. Uh, there are residual sports that are around us that uh, benefit from aquatics facilities uh, and um, uh, the, the list can go on, but uh, many of you have that experience, so I won't spend too much time on that. But from our standpoint, one of our most important pillars is the growth of the sport, the growth of people swimming, the growth of facilities, uh, and the expansion of facilities. Uh, and in many cases, um, uh, some of you are at capacity in your regions, uh, and uh, we're very happy to have you here. And in some cases, some of you don't have facilities in your regions and you're looking for um, a, a facility and how to uh, get to that point. And uh, uh, hopefully we provide that insight for you today. So we use a company called IMI Data Research, uh, as does Air Canada, Royal Bank, the banking system, transportation system. And uh, they do, uh, these are the people that do the surveys over the phone or stop people in the street. Uh, and uh, while we have a uh, 30 pages of, of data, I wanted to show one. Um, so uh, this was uh, something that they uh, asked uh, the general public. Uh, this was not from the sewing community. They asked it from the general public. What are essential for things for children? 52% said learning to read. 43% said learning how to swim. 38% said exercising. So uh, learning to read uh, uh, was obviously number one, but learning how to swim is extremely important to the average Canadian family. Uh, and these are the same families that are being uh, interviewed and, um, and polled uh, for uh, other questions, whether it be for transportation, uh, banking, different things like that. Uh, so it's a it, it, it's a great data, great research, and uh, we'll be launching them again to do more research in the future, especially post uh, post uh, our COVID recovery and how that recovery uh, plays out. Uh, as there there uh, there may be some social social changes coming out of uh, the COVID recovery, and so we want a good indicator of what the population is thinking. Okay, investing in Canada. So let's get right into it. So the investment in Canada, the government of Canada has earmarked $180 billion over the next 12 years. That doesn't include the uh, emergency COVID funding for uh, what the government announced as shovel-ready projects or near shovel-ready projects. That is to get jobs going uh, and uh, recreation facilities is one of the top priorities on their list. Uh, pools is uh, very high on that list. Uh, it will create not only jobs, it'll create legacy and jobs for the future. So uh, they're not just one-time hits, but they're long-term investments uh, that also benefit the communities. And so um, when you take a look, the second bucket of the, the green uh, which is 20, uh, $26.9 billion, uh, in addition to the monies that the government of Canada has announced. And I'll talk about that on how to access that those funds, um, how to get started if you're not sure where to get started. And those of you that have used infrastructure money, uh, this, uh, this may sound a little bit repetitive, but um, I wanted to just run through these uh, uh, before we get into the, the next section. So uh, when we take a look and uh, we, um, we will uh, blow up this section a little bit or be able to, uh, for you to, uh, to, to see this, but 40% uh, uh, of the uh, projects um, are going to the, uh, through pro provincial programs and uh, not-for-profit programs or not-for-profit. So uh, pools, libraries, different things like that along those sides. Um, uh, fifty percent are are provincially based projects. So whether it's a provincial municipal partnership that goes through, uh, the monies are flowing through there. And then the the rest, uh, seventy five percent of the projects in the territories are uh, mainly projects based with Indigenous peoples. 
um, and we'll be able to, to uh, share these in more detail, but uh, they're also easily available on the Government of Canada website. So when we take a look at the, uh, the, uh, the first two, the, the, the social and the green, um, community and cultural recreational based projects are at the top and um, they have also announced additional funding there for a sec. Uh, they've also announced uh, initial, uh, additional infrastructure funding for shovel-ready projects, near shovel-ready or upgradable projects. So uh, that information is available on the Infrastructure Canada website. However, uh, a lot of these decisions ha have been made and, and uh, the government is catching up on the paperwork on how to apply it for things. Uh, what we do know uh, is that um, uh, the process for accessing these funds, which has been traditionally very laborious um, and uh, required uh, lots of, of uh, effort, will require reduced effort. I'm not going to say uh, it will be easy to apply for these funds, but it will be easier. Uh, the, the government has recognized that uh, the economy is, is uh, uh, at the top of the priority uh, right behind healthcare. And so um, once healthcare gets under control, the economy and the restart of the economy and the restart of social activities, um, as we heard the 500 million going into Heritage Canada, uh, that's extremely important to get the festivals, arts and sports up and running again. Uh, we will uh, partake in that uh, from that standpoint and work with Heritage Canada to uh, get people active in sport uh, but the arts and the festivals um, are uh, extremely important. Uh, so the facilities that go around uh, a, lot, a lot of these uh, programs and projects uh, have been identified by Infrastructure Canada, both with the current funding model, as well as uh, the $95 billion that they're looking to invest uh, moving forward uh, in the short term, uh, which means those funds will be easier to access if you have a project uh, either currently underway, about to start, or uh, you're uh, ready to start uh, moving forward towards those projects. So how to access these funds? Um, every uh, government department has a very similar process, um, is uh, contacting Infrastructure Canada with a letter of intent the letter of intent is a letter of intent to apply uh, for permission to apply for funding. Uh, so uh, that's no different than Sport Canada and no different than Health Canada. Uh, when applying for a project, uh, there's a letter of intent sent uh, to request uh, permission to apply for a project. And then uh, after that, what happens uh, typically is a program officer is assigned to that program and then, uh, and then uh, things move forward. And so, we have seen from the heritage standpoint uh, and are uh, in speaking with our partners at the infrastructure and health departments, uh, they have accelerated the approvals of projects uh, by almost tenfold. So, uh, and uh, obviously related to uh, the situation in the country and emerging from the COVID situation, uh, which will be in phases and steps, of course, and. Uh, health will dictate uh, the speed. However, um, that, that it's extremely important to get the economy up and running. And there will be overlap there where health and you know, the economy will have to overlap to get things moving forward, which presents our community with a fabulous opportunity to, um, and I think it may be a once in a, a lifetime, uh, hopefully we don't get uh, put in this position again, uh, but at the same time, uh, there are some opportunities uh, available that, that are positive that we have to look at and, and really um, take advantage of. And, and that's the restart of the economy, creating jobs, creating social items that are uh, legacy items for the general public. And aquatic facilities is um, considered low-hanging fruit. Um, like I mentioned before, it leaves a legacy, it creates jobs, it creates future jobs, it creates social activity, it creates health, uh, healthy living. Um, and um, 
so the next step would be to contact your provincial territorial government um, and uh, see what um, uh, matching services might be offered there. Um, traditionally, the government of Canada has always looked for matching uh, dollars. And in this case here, uh, they haven't outright said that. So they may kickstart projects uh, without necessarily provinces or territories having available funds. It's really uh, getting that letter of intent started, getting the program officer assigned to you, and then moving forward from there, as well as uh, your local municipality and, of course, the approvals of, of, of having that behind you. Letters of support from partners, uh, uh, such as Swimming Canada, we write letters of support uh, for uh, municipalities, for user groups, for people intending to expand, grow, build their facilities, uh, and so we're happy to do that as well as our other aquatics partners, whether uh, they be from the Aquatics Canada group, swimming, uh, uh, artistic, diving, and water polo, or our other partners, Red Cross, YMCA, and, um, and the Life Saving Society. So um, that brings me to the uh, end of uh, the introduction. And uh, I would like to invite uh, Stu Isaac, um, to take us through the next section. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, Stu's background is extremely diverse and uh, has worked uh, on both sides of the border uh, and has profound experience uh, with our communities and, and the US communities. And so I'll turn it over to Stu. Thank you. Okay, looks like I may not have been unmuted. Okay, I'm on. So again, many of you have been working on a pool for a long time. Many of you have been dreaming about a pool for a long time. Ahmed has teed up quite a few opportunities that may exist now to help us expedite that process. What we're trying to do from my perspective here in this presentation is to try to make sure that we can tee up the opportunities for you, the process for you, and understand not only the normal process you would go through in developing a facility, but what is particularly in this case, what is relevant to trying to expedite that and even tap some of these opportunities for potential funding. So you can see the goals of these presentations are understanding your needs, identifying opportunity, the challenges, the process, and strategy and action. You see a photo of a competitive 50 meter by 25 meter pool. That is probably the last time in this presentation you'll see this pool because much of what we're gonna talk about has to do with the community and integration of community and sport friendly pools. Whoop, we're kind of a, a little sensitive on the touch here. So now understanding your needs the majority, the vast majority of you in this webinar have a background in competitive aquatics, or that's one of the priorities of your group. Training, competition, local, regional, provincial, national needs and interests, and really not just swimming, but across all the aquatic sports. What I wanna stress when we look at those funding programs, when we look at the criteria, there is the intent to bring in the sport resources, even the high performance aspects of that, but none of these projects will work or be successful without the community aquatic component. I can't stress this enough, and we're gonna talk more and more about this throughout this presentation. I'm talking recreation, fitness, health and wellness, programming with the schools, accessibility of the facility, the cost of using the facility. You can see I've identified some activities, a rock climbing wall in the pool, yoga classes on float boards or paddle boards, 
a, a, a running team working out cross training in the pool. You're going to see many examples of recreation, fitness, educational programs that can be done within that rectangular 50 meter body of water. When we move on, this is just a collage. You know, a picture's worth a thousand words. Again, I wanted to stress the variety of all these potential programs you've got. I emphasize the phrase rectangular recreation because I want to make sure you all understand how these things can work together. You do not have to sacrifice community programming, recreational programming, fitness programming for a competitive 50 meter pool. The picture in the upper right hand corner, that's a zip line at a major competitive 50 meter pool in the US. They had those inflatables. They had all kinds of activities, a zip line, all in the pool for an after school program. And in 20 minutes, they had the pool reconfigured for 50 meter training for the club team that was then coming into the pool. So again, just wanted to make sure that is always in your mind that you have that opportunity. Identifying opportunities is huge. We're talking about the potential for new funding opportunities and resources. And I'm, we're gonna talk a little bit more about funding shovel-ready projects and what defines a shovel-ready project. But in the opportunities, Ahmed talked about the stimulus and recovery programs. It's also very important, it's also very important that you have the, the new building and mechanical pool technology, the ability to reduce construction costs with new technology, which Mirtha will talk about reducing the annual and long-term operating and maintenance costs. These are all things that are very critical to putting together these potential programs, the requests for these funds, but also these are all elements that you would engage in on any development of an aquatic center, whether it's targeting some of the new funding opportunities or not. There are new trends in coexisting competitive and recreational aquatic amenities, features, and designs. These are really important because there's a lot of new technology, new fun games, new things that help us again adapt and integrate a 50 meter rectangular competitive pool with a great recreational friendly rectangular pool. So again, these are gonna be one of the keys to success in your planning of these next steps. Clearly, heightened awareness of sport and community needs coming out of this COVID stay-at-home lockdown, we're going to be doing everything possible to help re-engaging the community. And an aquatic center linked with a community center is going to be one of the most important parts of that. I don't need to tell you all that some of the current challenges for the comp competitive aquatic community, but I want you to make sure that you keep these all in the back of your mind because these are some of the factors that will help Swimming Canada, the provincial sections, all support the efforts making to get these funds to rally community support, rally provincial support. And again, it's not enough pool time and space. Fight for the pool space with other organizations. Lack of year-round 50 meter training. You can see this, it's all very critical. If we have an event need, perhaps, I view it as more that mid-size event for provincial level, uh, regional competition, the smaller national events. These are all very important to what we're trying to accomplish with some of these programs. Now fast forwarding shovel ready projects. What does that really mean? Shovel ready, to say some funding will be available for shovel ready projects is a bit of what I would consider a catch 22 or a chicken and egg issue. If a project really is shovel ready, it's probably funded already. You don't get a project to the shovel ready point if you don't have funding in place. Ahmed made a comment about shovel ready or near shovel ready. What we have to do is really understand what that means in the accessing of these funds. How important is strategic planning to developing that? How do we shorten that design and development process, which Dan and Mirtha will address? 
expediting the approval and funding process. The things we're gonna talk about next in terms of the process and the challenges are all steps you have to take to shorten that design and development process and expedite the approval and funding process. Prime candidates. If you've got a facility that is in desperate need or it's in the master plan for renovations, that could be pulled forward. Projects already in development that need to be upgraded, perhaps a 25 meter pool project already on the drawing board or in the development of the master plan that can be expanded to a 50 meter project. These are all things that will provide what I would consider the, the low hanging fruit to get something shovel ready. You have to make sure you address what I call the public misconceptions of aquatic facilities, particularly competitive facilities. Pools always lose money. Well, that depends on the goals of the community or the municipality in subsidizing programs. What does that really mean? What does sustainable mean for any facility? I'm not a swimmer. I will never use it. Well, let's, we've got to educate people to how a non-swimmer uses a pool. All the things you can do in this, which we've just shown in many of the, the photos. I like the programs, but they're never offered at the right times or when I can participate. They're never lap lanes when I want to swim. All of these things are critical. And every one of these elements, you can address in your planning. You can address in your design and the flexibility of designs. So these are going to be very, very important in the process. I want to stress, since many of you are involved in the public um, and are part of the competitive aquatic community, how we're perceived as part of the competitive aquatic community is critical. Often we're the loudest voice at the table. We have the narrowest interests. We're lobbying to prioritize these interests. We're not interested in the overall community goals and aquatic needs. All we want is more pool time for less money. We don't want to share space. Each one of these are things I've heard when I've consulted with communities or with the, uh, I hear comments from public engagement sessions. If any of those apply or are, you feel, hey, boy, that might describe us when you take a close look at yourselves in the mirror. These are issues you've got to overcome. Project capital costs are addressed in the MIRTHA portion, but there's a lot of alternate technology and flexible facility designs that can help. The development of project partners, very critical. Very important that one of the challenges that always comes up is the annual and long-term net operating and maintenance costs. When you're going through this process, you've got to make sure you really address those issues. Feasibility studies are something means different things to everybody. You will all are in this position at some point where someone will say, or you'll say yourselves, we need a feasibility study. I caution you because a feasibility study means different things to different people. They can be very, very helpful. They can be a great tool, or they can be a document that doesn't provide you what you really need, and then it sits on a shelf. Now, when we look at a feasibility study, I want to address it for just a second. Thanks to our friends at the Big Bang Theory, it's not rocket science. Much of a feasibility is common sense. You see at the bottom of the whiteboard, the pool equals 4W plus 1B equals HW. That's four walls and one bottom will hold water. You know, let's start with the basics. And that's one thing I really try to stress is that often we try to do too much with a feasibility study and too much of things you don't really need. One of the challenges is a macro feasibility study where you're really addressing your needs, whoop, just jumped ahead, where you're really addressing your needs on a per capita base and using, um, well, again, the controls are a little finicky here. The number of pools or square footage per capita. We see this often in feasibility studies, and it gives no consideration to the kind of pool you're actually um, need to build. So, they, sorry for this. This is, uh, it's, it's really, I'm kind of losing control of this, and I apologize. Well, 
well, anyway, I will keep moving forward and try to catch up on these screens uh, properly. And it's reacting slowly to the uh, bunch. Okay. We really try to stress a program use, demand, opportunity, and management-based feasibility study. It's got to be market-specific, understanding stakeholders and partnerships, integrating overall community aquatic programming. I call it a hub-and-spoke program, meaning the best communities are served by some neighborhood pools with aquatic services addressing the neighborhood, and then a larger facility that may help really fill the needs for overall bigger aquatic programming but still able to suit the uh, community needs or the neighborhood needs in that particular area of the, the hub pool. It might also be considered magnet facilities. We need management-based financial and operating analysis. And this is something that we don't see in many feasibility studies. So really understand that your financial projections in your feasibility study are really being driven by what is um, really how a pool is run. So you need to have someone with experience in management helping work with you on that. Don't pay for what you already know. Focus on what you need and make your questions clearly known to your consultant. But make sure you're also asking your consultant, how, what other questions do you need to answer? What am I not asking in the feasibility study? They may be able to help you to identify what you need to know that maybe you don't even know to ask these questions. We often find that People don't really know what they don't know as it relates to this. So, all of this leads up to the development process. You've ident we've talked about needs and opportunities. Engage the resources available to you and any professional services needed. This can be key stakeholders, potential partners, user groups. Take a look at the partners you may develop. These partners can be capital funding, they can be annual operating support, they can provide site and land, they can provide in-kind services. We see this much more in the states where more and more aquatic centers are being built with partnerships. You really need to focus on where those partnerships are in your community, in your province, nationally, and how you can pull those together. Because I see more and more of those public-private partnerships really helping pools become a reality. I wanna stress that program precedes design. That is critical. You need to identify the full range of programming, involve all constituencies, gain your commitments for use in space. We talk about program needs drive design flexibility. I've included photos that Dan will talk about where we have a split bulkhead. This is a brand new technology. There's only one in the world, but it allows us to create a facility that provides 50 meter and 25 meter lanes concurrently. We can, the way it's set up there, we could have five 50 meter lanes, five 25 meter lanes, and a 25 meter section that would be used for community programming. The development process continues with a schedule model. You see a sample schedule model there. Many people tell me, boy, that's too much detail at our point in the process. Well, you need this kind of detail because understanding how you fit everybody in, all the user groups, all the commitments, drives your design. It also allows your stakeholders and potential partners to get on board with the project because they see exactly what they can get. It also informs your financial operating analysis. I don't want to see you project um, $300,000 in Learn to Swim if you've only set aside enough time to generate $100,000 in Learn to Swim. Same thing, addressing those challenges. You notice I've got yellow lap lanes. There are some lap lanes available throughout the day. So again, sharing with your, uh, your club team and your community use. So again, maximizing that flexibility with the design that's built on program use and schedule models. This all comes before the design, then assess the site options, identify priorities, develop your management and staffing model, and then, as we mentioned earlier, develop the financial and business model projections. Your strategy and action plan, create a detailed action timeline with responsibilities, accountability, 
milestone. Don't leave this to your consultants. Make it a partnership. Don't leave it just to your stakeholders. This has to be a coordinated effort. I talk about the roles of clubs, user groups, and stakeholders. Create that advocacy group. When I look at the people that are on this call, it is great to see because you have in this group on the call the whole opportunity for provinces. I've got nine different provinces and territories on this call. We've got 18 club teams. We've got 16 cities or municipalities. We've got five advocacy groups. This is great because ultimately to make this work, all of you will need to be working together. An advocacy group needs to have breadth and scope, not just competitive swimming. You need to work as an advocacy group with the municipality in community engagement and be part of the process. We need to engage our partners, engage resources and support. Professional services, you can identify paid services you need, but you have a lot of resources within a club or within the community that can provide pro bono resources. Swimming Canada, your provincial sections, sport organizations, the um, Aquatic Sport Council of Ontario, all groups that have great resources and that we're trying to expand. Regular communication between municipalities and the stakeholders is critical. And early in the process, identify and address the hurdles, resistance, and the challenges we talked about earlier. Next steps. We know we want to continue this series. We hope that these become in more detail since today clearly is a very top-down view. We want to expand topics and increase the detail to parallel and support your facility development in your communities and regions. We also want to develop additional materials and resources to help you with all this process. Your input is going to be critical in that, in developing these. Future topics may be strategy and planning, identifying your know, partnerships. It might be integrated programming design between competitive and community. Operating analysis. All these things are next potential topics. Mirtha is going to talk technology and design, but we also want to have future ones that focus on air handling. Uh, trends in aquatic design, pool mechanical systems, water safety. Um, then we move down to uh, a webinar and hopefully we'll be able to answer all your questions, even if we don't get to them during the webinar. And now I wanna turn it over to Mirtha. The Mirtha team is unique in the industry and in their commitment to competitive aquatics because both as a company and individuals, it's in their DNA. They are a great resource, do not consider Mirtha and as management team, just as your pool builder. They can help you throughout your process. They are a great resource in many areas of project development and a proactive partner. And when you run into design and even strategic hurdles and challenges, they can help because they have such a huge and wide range of applications and project scope. So um, I'll turn it over to Dan Thompson, who Ahmed's already introduced. So Dan, take it away. Hopefully everyone can hear me now. Thanks so much, Stu. Uh, we'll go to the... Can everyone hear me now? I'm hopeful. Okay. For the past 10 years, Mirtha uh, has, is, sorry, uh, Mirtha is the world's largest stainless steel uh, pool company. There are two kinds of pools in this world. There are concrete pools and there are stainless steel pools. Um, we, um, uh, we were formed in 1961. Uh, we're in over 72 countries and, and have produced over 55,000 pools uh, in that time. We have about 350 employees, but what's really critical is that about 75 of those are engineers and designers. Uh, in Italy. So we do um, turnkey design uh, uh, for our product. Uh, Mirtha Pools Canada was formed in 2018 and we are one of seven uh, global subsidiaries. We also have 75 facilities and over 130 tanks uh, in Canada. Not sure. In terms of um, our relationships, we've had a relationship with, um, with FINA for the last 10 years plus. Um, and the majority of the world championship pools and many of the Olympic pools are Mirtha pools. For example, the 2016 Rio Olympics was held in a, in a Mirtha pool. 
Uh, Mirth also has extensive relationships around the world with swimming organizations, uh, Swimming Canada being, being one. And since our relationship started, uh, we have had, held, there are over 144 uh, world records held in our pools. Next slide. But we are more than competitive pools, although that certainly is part of our DNA. We're about fun, leisure, and, and wellness. Um, Mark will, will, tell to, will talk to this more. But in 2018, we created a new division called Mirtha Wellness. And we are creating spas, saunas, steam baths, uh, hot and cold plunges, sensory showers, salt rooms, ice and snow rooms, and much more. So basically, if you can imagine uh, a concept that you dream of, that you'd like to have in a facility, we can come up with it. And we've got examples of these all over the world. So what are we seeing in the marketplace? Well, there's two areas of opportunities, uh, renovation expansions and new builds. Uh, in terms of renovation ex extensions, we're seeing uh, lots of old infrastructure in need of substantial repair. These are 30, 40 year old tanks that in many instances haven't been uh, updated. We see old leaky concrete tanks. We see uh, many uh, facilities that aren't meeting FINA and S SNC standards, which was changed in 2018 from 1.25 1 1.2 meters to 1.35 in terms of your ability to dive off a block and compete. Uh, in Ontario alone, we have nine 50 meter pools that no longer are, are meet the standards and can only use one end of the pool, which has a financial impact on, on, um, on, on, on many clubs. Uh, we do see a lack of preventative maintenance. Uh, we see slides in disrepair or just not operated with Ms. Sally's talking about taking them out because they're very co costly to, to operate. We also see a lot of end of life uh, HVAC and mechanical systems, a lack of UV, rusting valves, pumps, and really many organizations who really haven't taken the time to create those refurbishment budgets to, to address these things. Um, next slide. Let's see. Good. Um, in terms of new builds, um, as Stu alluded to, we see arduous municipal tender processes nationwide, all the more reason to get on top of your feasibility uh, plans and to um, ensure that you've got the right design, the right understand the capital costs, and really take a, 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 a time to develop the program and the operating costs. Um, as Stu alluded to, macroeconomic feasibility studies are a challenge for all of us. Um, in many instances, it's a six-lane pool for 30,000 or 45,000 residents, and it really doesn't take into fact the programming and the needs of the community. Um, and there is just a lack of thoughtful capital and operating budgeting. And this is, this is job one, and think this, this is something that I think we need to, as Canadians, do a better job in. We also see uh, many communities trying to, uh, uh, and, and architectural firms who, are to, who start from scratch. And there are not a lot of economies of scale, um, and there can be uh, in creating turnkey designs. We have an example in California where we have a piggyback program and we, we've built 25 identical pools, outdoor pools, um, for high schools across California. And we need to do more of that in Canada. There's a huge opportunity for public-private partnerships. Uh, Quebec is doing a good job. We've got one developer that's, that's managing uh, four facilities, building four facilities and managing them, four communities. Uh, and we think that's, that's a, a future trend. Next slide, hopefully. Okay. Oops, sorry, one back. Can we go one slide back? My, okay, good. So how can Mirtha Pools help you get shovel ready? We are very interested in working with communities to uh, supply uh, concepts on tank designs. So if you are, are looking for a 50 meter or a 25 meter leisure pool uh, and you have a certain design in mind and you wanna, you wanna get our help, we've got hundreds of examples from all over the world and we're, we're very, very willing to do that. We want to be a trusted uh, resource in terms of understanding FINA and SNC standards and the local health regulations. So we're very interested in, in helping communities with that. 
We also, uh, we, as we've talked about, we've got um, a huge array of examples from around the world. We have colleagues all over the world and, and, and hundreds of different examples of 50 meter pools, 25 meter lap training pools, wellness centers, uh, leisure pools, et cetera. Um, and I think one of the things to keep in mind is when you work with Mirtha, you're getting a fully designed tank with integrated Mirtha elements within the tank. And most of those elements are in the gutter, so they don't have to be on the deck. And so we offer a very turnkey process as well. Uh, we uh, can score up to uh, 44 lead programs, and we've got a, a very exhaustive lead, uh, a green mapping program that uh, Mirtha has, has developed and just re-released. So I'll turn it over to Mark, who will talk about uh, more of the technical side of our business. Thanks, Dan. Uh, as Dan alluded, we aim to be a bit of a, a one-stop shop, but also to help you connect the dots with consultants like Stu. And we're obviously uh, very proud to be partnered with Swimming Canada, supporting the sport and hopefully uh, supporting your projects. Uh, compared to traditional pool design, Mirtha uses alternative building materials, which I'll try to describe to you here, and uh, that are 80% lighter, and they have half the embedded greenhouse gas. Uh, Mirtha is essentially the exclusive process of laminating rigid PVC to marine grade stainless steel. It's pre-manufactured in our quality control settings and they're modular. The system is bolted together, not welded together, which lends to creating the exact dimensions we use in the competition space uh, and also provides for a lot of resilience to handle forces on the pool like seismic, high groundwater and building settlement. All of our structures are designed to be freestanding. So whether the pool is empty or full or backfilled or a corridor pool, uh, the structure is, is designed to stand on its own. Our proprietary membranes, They use the same PVC materials that brings clean drinking water to all of us every day and creates a soft finish, resistant to algae, UV, and cool chemicals. Our waterproofing is warranted for 10 years. Here you can see some of the typical structures of a Mirtha system and our floor bottom. We provide the full range of gutter systems used in pools from, from skimmers right through to the overflow competition systems. Uh, for your leisure areas, we do all sorts of freeform overflow. Uh, and then what I'll showing at the end here is our popular classic tile-free overflow system. We're trying to bring sport together and with leisure through integrating all those accessories as Dan alluded to. We're now building deck supporting structures, which has always been a challenge during the construction. And our dimensional precision that extends to the freeform finger walls, transfer walls, islands, and entries. We accommodate all sorts of sprays, lights, and window systems into our pools. And we can also integrate wellness future features. So here you can see our hydrotherapy benches, stairs, lounges, and fountains. As we saw a little bit through Stu as well, in the competition space, we provide or integrate all the features required for an Olympic standard facility, but also support the training space with features like the split bulkheads, pass through lane lines, and we're particularly proud of our attractive fiberglass blocks. On the leisure side, we integrate stanchion posts, grab rails, lane anchors, uh, and sprays directly into the gutter system to maximize your deck space. Our softwalk floor system, it's a unique surface that's safety rated for headfalls and children, great for aqua size and high traffic areas, and appreciated by therapeutic clients like diabetics. It can cover many contours. On the renovation space, uh, obviously adding uh, expanding existing facilities, whether to achieve code compliance, adding accessibility, 
competition accessories, or to provide a durable finish can help you avoid freeze and thaw effects of the Canadian outdoors for your outdoor projects. Competition headwalls are, that are removable when configured for training and allow continuous overflow are all possible. There are five minutes, 10 minutes. Beach entry additions are great leisure additions uh, and also for accessibility. Once again, great with our soft walk. We'll show two of our typical gutter renovations, either when you're replacing a skimmer or a return system at the existing deck level. Or we can cut away uh, and build the gutter on top of your deck level to help you get the sanctioned depths for stepping up to around the pool. All right, we have a new product called Skin, which is our uh, flexible version of our laminated steel, which can cover also a wide variety of surfaces and provide a, a lot of exciting new solutions. Uh, with, great part of working with Mirtha is we get to work with a lot of the very innovative companies around the world, uh, and uh, including our wellness division, which is obviously addressing that growing space uh, for wellness demand and facilities where we can provide the same sterile, dimensionally precise, pre-manufactured facilities for sauna, steam, plunge pools, uh, and help concepting to really bring the most effective and popular therapies out there. We work with the uh, all movable floor manufacturers, but particularly like Vario Pool, uh, as is for its reliability and ease of operation. Uh, globally, we get to see a lot of building solutions, but fortunate to have a Canadian partner in Sprung. They similarly use the pre-manufactured, easily constructed materials, and we're working with them, trying to bring scalable, cost-effective, and energy-efficient buildings to any region of Canada. So that's just a little snippet of some of the projects and, and uh, areas that we try to provide. Uh, thanks. We look to be inspired by your challenges, so thanks for getting in touch to uh, explain any more. Uh, thanks again to Swimming Canada and to Stu for the great information today, and I'll pass it back. All right. Um, thank you for all that uh, great information. Um, if we can just unmute the presenters, I have a couple of questions I, I've written down and we'll uh, see if some come up in the, uh, the chat box here. Um, so uh, just to address some of those uh, misconceptions that might be out there, um, Mirtha, can, can you talk about in, uh, indoor versus outdoor pools in the, the Canadian climate and how the Mirtha pool works in the Canadian climate on in an outdoor kind of cold environment where the pools are closed for the, the winter. So let's say an outdoor pool. Mark, you, you answer that. Sure. Uh, yeah, we've got a lot of terrific examples. Uh, certainly the, the membranes designed to withstand uh, the cold and also has the UV treatment on it to avoid degrading. Uh, a, a number of pools, uh, order of uh, 15, 20 years old. Uh, so uh, while it's not common for the outdoor pools, uh, Mirtha in general is, is growing. So we're definitely looking to, to do more projects in that space. Uh, certainly a part of the Mirtha system is its ease, uh, having things not embedded in concrete. So whether it's a mechanical issue or a structural issue, um, any of the building systems uh, with Mirtha, it's easy to locate, access and repair the issues. So it's certainly one advantage. Uh, and yeah, uh, you are avoiding a lot of those uh, traditional maintenance issues that are amplified in the outdoor setting, such as the uh, re retiling and regrouting. Can I add, uh, Stan, the, um, the, the 2005 World Championship pools in Montreal are outdoor Mirtha pools. The, uh, the uh, pool in, we just did, did a pool in, in Lethbridge, Harrison Crossing. Uh, there's one Bow Valley in Calgary, there is one in Exeter, and there is one we're going to put in this year at, in Dorchester, near London. So we do have them, and um, they, work, they work very well. We've got another one in Lavovic, uh, north of Toronto. So we do have experience, and they, they do hand up, uh, stand up to Canadian winners. We have a question that just came in, but I'm just going to address another one that was earlier. So in terms of, uh, and this is for Stu, 
in terms of a feasibility study, uh, would there be some kind of template that you would recommend um, for someone to use as a starting point? That's a very good question. And in fact, Ahmed, and to the person or people that have asked that question, one of the things I thought about was developing really exactly that to maybe post on the SNC website, something that, you know, what you should be looking for, what would be a format, and help you focus on that. One thing I want to encourage, if you talk to a consultants and ask for a feasibility study, you might get a package that's $50,000. But portions of that, answering your specific needs can be done much more uh, at a much lower cost. For example, I saw one question that came in, I think from uh, Kevin Anderson, what is the operating cost of a 50 meter pool in Canada? Well, that's almost impossible to answer because there's so many variables, but it can be done for your local community or your local project model very quickly without doing a whole feasibility study. So I think the takeaways are, let's, uh, let's see if we can put together something that would help you as a guide to getting a feasibility study, what you would look for and the ranges and the template that that might include. I think that's a great idea and a great follow-up to some of the resources we can help provide through Swimming Canada and hopefully through the provinces. So that um, so we have the contact information of everyone on here, which uh, will be shared. Uh, the presentation will be shared. Uh, we will look to put the recording somewhere. So I just wanted to address some of those. Uh, we'll also have la version française aussi. C'est juste en traduction, mais on va mettre la version en français. Uh, so um, people can have that as a follow-up and in terms of, of, of pricing or, or different things like that um, like Stu said it, it really varies on the you know the size the features the functions uh, the, the uh, area and different things like that and and so you know uh, we've seen fairly inexpensive 50 meter uh, pools and we've seen extremely uh, complicated multi-purpose facilities. So uh, that don't just have uh, pools, but one, they have multiple pools, uh, splash tanks, different things like that, recovery tanks. So it really varies um, on, on what the requirements are. And so I think that would be better directed maybe offline to Dan and Mark uh, and Stu uh, in terms of what, what types of requirements you're thinking of, what your population is and all those other factors that might influence that. Yeah. Um, and we will certainly be glad to answer those questions. And as Ahmed said, our emails for Dan, Mark, myself, are all at the end of this presentation. So we're happy to respond offline. Right. So I guess another question here for uh, potentially Mark is uh, what, what are some technologies that perhaps can uh, help? I'm just rewording the question. Uh, um, uh, that that can uh, that can help with the operation chemicals different things like that that are, are some best practices that you might see out there that complement um, the the facility sure uh, yeah, uh, at the higher level certainly most facilities we speak to you know they operate within their own regional requirements and chemical use requirements and levels uh, we always try to help them operate at a, a ideal level for both the pool structure and, and public health. Uh, so that's always a balance. Uh, the, really, the one big distinction from Eartha is that it is an inert surface. So your, your whole pool is not reacting with your pool chemicals. So particularly on when you're refilling the pool, uh, balancing those chemicals can be very quick and easy because you're not having the leaching and, and, and vice versa with the grouting. So, um, that, that is the largest aspect. Uh, a lot of the other main determinants come down to the mechanical system and the different types of uh, chemical treatment systems in the pool, uh, which varies. Uh, and certainly all sorts of mechanical systems are accommodated in Martha. So really, whatever you would put in a traditional pool, you can uh, put in the Let me address that question very quickly. There is new technology, really, that's only 8 to 10 years old in the filtration systems called regenerative media that increases the filtering capacity significantly. You've all heard about UV systems, ultraviolet disinfectant systems, which are very effective and will be very important in this post-COVID world. There is 
uh, variable frequency drives on each of these that significantly reduce the operating costs and the electrical draw on these. There's air handling systems that significantly reduce the amount of fresh air you need to bring in, new air, because you're exhausting a higher percentage of the bad air. So all of these things are something that when you have a feasibility study or talk to engineers, not only can they talk about the impact on your air and water quality, but they can impact your financial operating costs and your environmental friendliness of the facility. What we try to do is also to return on investment. Some of these cost more upfront, but you'll pay for them in two years with ongoing savings and long-term maintenance. So there's a whole lot of new facility uh, technology that I see in a very, very small percentage of the current major aquatic facilities in Canada. I see it on some of the new ones like Windsor and Teeth Pass, but again, a great opportunity for renovations, hopefully tapping some of this infrastructure money also. So Stu, a follow-up question to that. Once a pool becomes operational, and I'm uh, again, rewording a question here. Once a pool becomes operational, um, what are, uh, and you touched on some, but um, can you talk about an example or two where they've diversified their revenue in order to uh, break even or even uh, potentially uh, turn a profit to reinvest into a pool? A lot of that depends upon the philosophy of the owner of the pool. It's a great question. When I say a pool is sustainable financially, that may not be breaking even if one of the goals of the city is to provide discount learn to swim rates for residents or provide very low rental rates for the local swim team because they feel that's part of a community goal. What we have to do is really look at what those opportunities are. When we add events into the schedule, how does that balance daily revenue you might lose when you're giving up 10 weekends a year for events? What are the sponsorship opportunities? What are the additional programming? When I look at some of the programming we showed, the opportunity, the uh, rock climbing wall, the wibbits, the, those inflatable obstacle courses, the slack lines, all those things are all great entertainment and recreation opportunities that can be factored into increased membership usage, recreation times on the weekends or on holidays. It takes a look at a whole range of opportunities. Let me give you an example. My colleague, Dwayne Krell, has been the aquatic director for 27 years before I became a consultant at the University of Minnesota. Huge event facility. They had a lot of tip and roll bleachers. He made sure that he had a door big enough that he could run tip and roll bleachers out the back door and rent them to local people that needed them for their fields or a parade or something. He generated $40,000 a year US in excess revenue by running his tip and roll bleachers. There are a lot of little things like that that can really add up, but you've got to have professional management and the staff needed to execute these things. Okay, I, I have another question I wrote down here. Um, so there, there are many pools built in the 50s, 60s, and 70s concrete that are end of life. And um, that, yeah, I think, uh, Mark, you were referring to uh, opportunities to uh, potentially refurbish a pool uh, with newer technologies without having to create a whole new concrete system. Um, can, can you elaborate on that a little bit and, and what some potential opportunities are for people who are now facing, my, my, my pool's end of life and, and uh, do, we, you know, do we continue it or, or what can we do to cost effectively uh, refurbish this, this facility? Sure, uh, yeah, there's a, obviously a, a host of situations that a pool can be encountering. Uh, we Sometimes we see that a mechanical system will have been replaced in the last 10 or 15 years and then, but the pool system, the basin is either not up to code or they're looking to add a fresh new look or feature. Uh, so a simple thing has been to just cut an entry area five meters away from a sidewall and use that as, as an accessibility entrance to an entire extra beach entry or ramp entry for, for a, on a rectangular pool. Uh, so those are simple renovations that we can add to an existing structure uh, or times when there is, there's cracks, the pool is leaking quite a bit. Uh, and so rather than of doing a complete demolition and a new build, 
uh, but the pool is still structurally sound enough to reline with, with the system. Murtha can apply uh, basically the stainless steel walls to our floor membrane system on the existing basin. So we usually have structural engineer assess the project and then survey it to get the exact dimensions. And then having that model, Murtha will create all of the materials to, to come in on a rail system to slide down against the existing walls. And the similar floor goes on over top and that can, that can compensate for, for, for cracks of certain sizes as well as with our uh, softwalk system that can be smoothed over and further movement usually can be accommodated. So the big thing about Mirtha is all the interfaces are flexible and able to, to move uh, and provide the water tightness. So uh, yeah, those are probably the big main ones, a complete renovation of an existing basin that can stand alone or adding those features on the side. And can I add one more, Mark? Is uh, looking at um, many of these 50 meter pools that are no longer to depth standards. Uh, we, and most of them are skimmer as well. So we have a way we can cut off the beam. We can actually lift up the pool, uh, build um, a, a, a rim flow gutter on the, on the current skimmer and raise the level of the, of the water so that both ends can be compliant and you can get the 1.35 meter depth. So that's another opportunity that- And in the, mechanic, in the mechanical technical systems, as I pointed out earlier, if you look to replace those with the new technology, you will get better water, better air, at a lower operating cost, less environmental impact, and you'll probably pay for that renovation within two to three years of your operational cost savings. Okay, great. I, I have another question for you. Uh, we know that there are thousands of pools uh, in Canada, um, but there are tens of thousands of hockey arenas, and many of them are, are either being rebuilt, and, and some of them are, uh, rather than uh, you know uh, refurbishing the hockey arena, they may build a new one. Um, can we take a pool and put it in a hockey? I know the answer to this already, because we held a a world event with 200 countries in one, but uh, can we take a Mirtha pool long term and put it into a hockey arena uh, that where we already have the parking lot, the building, uh, the the bleachers? Um, what what can we do there from a, from a? I think we should let Stu answer that one because yes, we can do it, but the critical piece is the HVAC and the uh, mechanical system. It can be done. It can be done in some of the big box stores or warehouses that are closing. We've seen more put in into warehouses or, you know, a closed down um, Toys R Us store, for example. There's a lot of opportunities to repurpose existing facilities. But as Dan said, you've got to make sure you have some unique HVAC systems, uh, vapor barriers, the things you need to be able to maintain that facility long term. We find it's a great idea, but often with some of the new building technologies, it's cheaper if you have that space to knock it down and build a new lower cost facility, more specifically purposed for the pools. But it certainly is an option and one I think that is really worth looking at because there are a lot of good examples, many more in the US than in Canada of where that buildings like that have been repurposed. Right, without having to rebuild parking lots and different Correct. things like that where that's yep. already there. So, yep. okay. Um, I'm gonna go to the chat line here and see if there's any any questions. We have a few more minutes left and um, like to open it up and see if any other questions come up that we haven't already answered. Please feel free to, to type your question in, en français ou en anglais, and uh, we'll be happy to uh, to answer those. I see the question from Jill right here, but in case any more come in, but about the operating concern and would be interested in comparing the operation cost of a 25 meter by 50 meter. There is some economy of scale when going from 25 meter to 50 meter, but we found in almost all of our studies is that the demand for 50 meter pool time is so strong, you often can generate more revenue out of a 50 meter pool 
uh, more than in proportion to just the operating cost increases of going from 25 meters to 50. So we often see when you're comparing the operating cost, you have a better net result from a 50 because there's so much demand in a more regional footprint. So it may be net net less expensive to operate a 50 meter than a 25 meter. Okay, great. Uh, there's a question here, or a couple. Uh, let me just take a look at Jill's question. The comment, uh, okay, uh, feasibility of a movable floor, change of depth. Seems like a nice way to, to use a, uh, to maximize programming in a single tank. I'll address that because it comes yeah. from programming. If you asked me that question five years ago, I would have stayed away from it, but the technology has improved so much that movable floors are now much more reliable. They're not the maintenance headache they used to be. It is very important if you want to have a 50 meter pool that has all deep water, meet all the SNC and FINA and provincial requirements and, survive and support water polo, but you need some shallow space. I really encourage it, but keep in mind if you've got a 50 meter by 25 meter pool, it may be a million dollars to add that movable floor for a 45 foot section, once you, you know, the materials and the installation and everything. However, the programming impact would likely pay for that over a, a very short period, you know, several years, because it gives you so much more flexibility. A lot depends on the other aquatic facilities you have in your community and how much you need shallow water programming in that 50 meter and in the other pools you may have within that facility itself, like a warm water, shallow water teaching pool, program fitness pool. So again, it's a question that is integrated in the overall development of your aquatic facility and the community-wide program. Okay, great. Uh, there's a few more questions that have come in. Uh, we're running uh, close to time, so uh, I think we'll take three or four more. I'll answer the COVID one. Uh, so FINA and the World Health Organization have worked together. Um, and there are, uh, uh, there are quick studies that have already been done. And then there are longer term studies that they're working on. Uh, if you go to the Swimming Canada website, swimming.ca, and click on COVID-19 resources, uh, we update that on a frequent basis. And so it's not just Canadian studies. We, uh, we put in uh, anything related to COVID-19 um, and in all subjects in all areas. Uh, so uh, just uh, if, if there's something not there, if we haven't posted the World Health one yet, uh, it, it should be up there shortly. Uh, but the World Health Organization has worked with FINA to, uh, to discuss that. Um, and there's uh, longer term studies uh, I say longer term, they're, they're really going to come out in the short term, but uh, they're in, in progress right now. Uh, also, there's information from some other countries that if we find it viable for the Canadian uh, uh, environment here, we'll, we will post it uh, if it's relevant to our health and safety levels. Um, I love the comment from Ryan McDonald, uh, not really a question, when he says, I have never met an aquatic director that said after five years, they have more than enough pool space to meet the demand. And that's something you really got to look at, your growth plans, the stakeholder growth, the user growth. Couldn't agree more there. And that just doesn't apply to the pool space. It's the storage space. It's the office space. It's the whole complex. If you're going to have all those recreational components, you better have the storage to support it. So again, great, great comment, more than the question. But again, you're right. It's planning for the future. and with Swimming Canada, you know, it's the success. We'd anticipate a lot of growth, not only in competitive aquatics, but in the feeder programs. So true. Thank you for that comment. Uh, Stu, maybe I'll just add my perspective. You know, we often speak about the expected life of the pool uh, being 40, 50, 60 years is what people are hoping to get out of it. So we're also hoping to, you need to plan for that kind of future of will that pool be able to serve the community? in that time span as well. So really thinking for the future is, is huge. Yeah. All right, I'm just gonna back up a little bit. How fast can a concrete pool 50 meter be redone? 
I'll take that. It's Dan. I mean, it does depend on the complexity of the pool. Every pool needs to be surveyed. So if we're doing one of our rent of actions, um, you need to have a proper survey on the pool. We need to inspect it. We need to price it. Uh, there usually are other little components that come in. There are, it's never just the pool. It's the HVAC system or sorry, it's if it's outdoor, depending on what, what it is, HVAC or the mechanical systems. But uh, once we have, um, and the way Mirtha works is we'll, we'll do full design uh, for this. Uh, we'll, we'll quote a price and then we, uh, once uh, we need payment and once we're paid, it's, it's really about 90, 100, 90 to 120 days before we can get that uh, pool to your site. So you gotta, you gotta, there's some development time, but the actual reskinning of a 50 meter pool could be a two, a two month process, no more. Okay. And Ahmed, I see a great question here that just came in. For a swim club that has exclusive use of a city owned 25 meter, if the club wants to, assess whether the existing facility can be renovated for a 50, what would be the first step? Should we talk to the municipality first? Should we start our own feasibility study? What would you advise? Great question. And this is something that certainly can be done and it's a great opportunity to maybe access some of these government funds. But before you approach the municipality, you need some facts. You can't go in there with a dream. You've got to show that you've done your homework. Perhaps that you have a little skin in the game, but you certainly don't need a full feasibility study. You know, I think you would, can, you know, talk to a consultant, somebody you, you may want to work with, that can lay out very specific answers to what this we would anticipate the city would want to know. What you need to tell the city, what are the facts? What might be the projected cost in ballpark scope? What might be the impact on operating costs? This can be done with what we would consider a mini feasibility study. It doesn't have to be in any kind of depth like a standard municipality feasibility study. Then you go to them and show that you've done your homework. You've invested a little bit of your own money. You've got some skin in the game. And then that should be enough in that mini feasibility to really give them some facts. Then the city can move to the next step and say, well, let's study this further. And then they can help fund the, uh, a, a full study and more design and development detail to really see if it's feasible and whether it's uh, worth doing. And, and can I add to that, Stu? Because I think what we need to do here is we need to ensure that we've got aquatic experts that are creating aquatic feasibility studies. And often a municipality will hire a, a macroeconomic consultant and they will do a job that might entail looking at the rink and looking at a gym and looking at the pool, but they really won't go into enough depth to articulate what the potential capital costs and revenue exchanges on the, the actual building, and then an accurate five-year operating plan that, that really takes into consideration all the revenues, all the program expenses, and projects over a number of years. And add event economic impact. Yeah, if you go too. from a 25 to a 50, you may be able to host some, some more swim meets or other competition that would have economic impact in terms of heads and beds in the community. This is something that, you know, a, a very focused study initially, you could start to put that together for then the city or the municipality to take the next steps. And I, I read a lot of um, municipal strategic plans and I, I very rarely, if ever, see that level of detail. So it needs, you really need to have a dedicated aquatic feasibility study done on your pool. Okay, great. I'm gonna end with one last question. Um, so, uh, so if someone's interested and says, you know, we, we we're looking for a multi-purpose uh, recreational competitive uh, hybrid uh, that's cost effective, uh, can we visit one of your customers that you've already done or one of your clients do that that have already built that? And, and, and you know, it's kind of like looking at the car before you buy it, right? And so, can we, can we actually see it? Mm -hmm. So well, that's there's, for anyone. So, and that's a great question for Dan and Mark about looking at the physical aspects of a facility, and what, from a consultant's perspective, we would take a look at what might be the operating and management and budget of one of these existing facilities 
So you, you, when you talk about looking at comparable facilities, examples, you look at the, the actual facility itself, and then you look at the operating and program model. And so you can really do both. You need to do both. And we're happy to set up uh, introductions uh, with some of our facilities uh, at any time. So just give us your wish list of what you'd like to see in a facility and uh, we'd be happy to, to set something up. Okay, great. Uh, I, I know there's more questions coming in, but I'm, I'm going to end it here because we're, uh, we're at the end of time. Um, but I wanted to uh, thank everyone and those questions that we didn't get to. Uh, we can get to uh, later on by uh, by messaging an email. Uh, and please follow us. Uh, we will have more webinars. And uh, if you do have an idea for a webinar um, that uh, you're interested in something uh, to focus on specifically, please feel free to, to message Swimming Canada and uh, we will uh, take a look at it. Uh, we plan to do more of these and focus on different topics. Uh, today was really the shovel ready and, and uh, the, the, the basics behind that. But however, uh, obviously pool operating is a, is, sounds like a very strong theme um, and, uh, and, and uh, final sustainability, uh, financial sustainability. So uh, th those all sound like great themes, but if you have another one, please feel free to, uh, to contact us. Uh, so. I'd like to uh, thank the presenters uh, for being here. Um, every uh, everyone who's participated, all the participants on the call, and uh, the staff behind the scenes, um, Aaron and Martine, who have uh, made this uh, made this work. Uh, this is our first one. We plan to do uh, many more in partnership uh, with our our fabulous partners that are on the call here. So uh, thank you again for being here. And si vous avez des questions en français, soyez pas gênés de nous envoyer question en français and, and uh, we'll look to be posting this stuff and we'll be able to email you uh, with the location of uh, where we posted this. So thank you again.